Hello everybody, my name is Gemma Price and I am the Content and Community Manager for open to export I'll be hosting and moderating today. Um, now some of you may have already been on our previous export bootcamp webinars. Uh, this is the final in a series of four. All of the webinars are available to watch back on our YouTube channel, so if you have missed them you can just go and catch up. Uh, we have some excellent speakers and case studies lined up for you today. Uh, Stephen Turner heads up pet care product exporter Anomology. Um, Bill Brown is the managing director of firefighting and rescue equipment manufacturer and Gloco. Uh, I'll let the speakers introduce themselves fully uh, at the start of their presentations. Um, for those of you that don't know, Open to Export is a free online community for small and medium sized businesses looking to kind of realize their international ambitions. Um, we're supported by the Federation of Small Businesses, UK Trade and Investment and the Institute of Export and also HIBU. I would encourage those of you that have not already registered to, uh, to get registered and signed up on the site so that you can find out about our other webinars, also keep updated with our newsletter, ask questions on our Q&A forum, etc. cetera. Um, so just before I hand over to our first speaker, Stephen Turner, I'd just like to bring your attention to the kind of control panel that will be on the right-hand side of your screen. So you can see the functionality there to ask questions um, and chat with our speakers. Um, so we'll moderate them and put them to our speakers at the natural break, so the end of their presentations. Um, so if you do want to ask questions, please feel free to use that functionality. Um, alternatively, if you're not comfortable asking your question, you can kind of just post that on the Open to Export forum a little bit later on. Um, so if I hand over to Stephen Turner then to start off his uh, presentation. Stephen, are you there with us? I am with you. Fantastic. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm going to talk to you today about the strategies my company has employed to successfully export our products to more than 30 countries around the world. If you do have any questions, please feel free to interrupt at any time. Just use the uh, chat box on the screen. My company is Group 55. We established in 1999, and we started off as a, a, an e-commerce company selling pest control products. The company grew, and in 2007, we set up a, a demo just on the next slide there. Um, there we go. We grew to, uh, in 2007, to launch a brand of our own pest control products called Strikeback. And we enjoyed a great deal of success very quickly. We ended up with our products in more than 2,500 stores uh, within about six months. And that success was did not go unnoticed by the the big players within the, the pest control industry. And uh, combining that uh, pressure from the big boys uh, came a recession. And we could see that the, the growth of the business was going to be compromised um, if we didn't act and if we didn't adapt to survive. One of the problems that we identified with our pest control range was that we simply couldn't export the products. There was too much regulation surrounding the products. So whatever we were going to achieve was only ever going to be done domestically within the UK. So what we did was we, we regrouped, we looked at our strengths, um, we had to identify where we thought we would be, we would be able to survive and, and change and, and contribute to a, a new market. And one of the areas where we were having uh, a lot of success was with our flea control products within the pest, uh, the, the pet industry. And so we took a, a good look at that industry and we saw an opportunity within pet grooming products. And that brand then became Animology. And we launched that product range in 2010. And today we sell it in more than 30 countries around the world. New slide, Gemma. Before we look to exports, we did an awful lot of preparation uh, and an awful lot of research. We tried to identify um, all the incumbent products around the world, not just in the UK, to see what opportunities or gaps there were in the market that we could either capitalize on or, or fulfill. And that research took many months. We um, looked at the different ways in which products were marketed around the world. And we also looked at the different types of formulations that we used to try and get a real feel for what globally um, we, we felt uh, had the best chance for success. Once we 
had uh, put together the, the skeleton of the, the product, the idea, and the brand, we then looked towards what we had to do. What sort of packaging requirements were there going to be? What was the regulatory requirements? Uh, packaging of our particular products needs very specific markings, uh, possibly warnings. And then also we need to look at the functionality of the, the product. How can we sell to Canada? Well, we have to sell to Canada only if we've got English and French on the packaging. So we had to make sure that French was on the packaging as standard from the beginning. What we ended up with was a, a brand of products packaged with uh, between five and seven languages on all the products. And then with the capability of adding additional languages by over-stickering. So we, we have products that we sell in China, Russia, uh, Saudi Arabia that have languages appropriate for those markets that are over-stickered in an area that we knew we would be able to apply a sticker uh, as and when required. One of the other areas that we were keen to look at was the registration and the IP protection. We all look to uh, protect our intellectual property in the UK, if we're based in the UK, but our distributors, uh, more than anybody, are keen to ensure that our IP is protected where they are operating in uh, and it's no less important for every country in which you're trading. We took advice from absolutely everywhere and spoke to anybody we could. We spoke to UKTI, uh, trade associations, industry contacts that we had and industry contacts that we didn't have. We, we pestered, uh, we called people who were generally non-competitive and asked for their time and generally we found that people were happy to help. One of the areas that we took a long time over was getting our trading terms. How were we actually going to trade? How, how was that going to happen? And what we found was that the best option for us was to trade on an XWorks basis. Um, it means that we get the cash up front on delivery. We're not involved in the shipping or, or the, the complexities of the logistics. And that, that seemed to be a plan that would work and it has so proved. We also looked at the distributor profile, not just necessarily who we might be able to sell to and who our targets were, but in markets where we didn't know who we were going to sell through, the type of company that we wanted to be working with. And then the final thing that we put together uh, in great detail was the marketing plan. We ensured that uh, from uh, the product literature, which was uh, multilingual, lingual, to the uh, website, the uh, social media platforms that we worked on, the international branding control, the way in which adverts appeared in press around the world, all had to be consistent and in line with the brand that we were hoping to launch and succeed with. And all of that was done before any of the success came our way. New slide. Once you have launched and success comes your way, there are a number of things that we learned um, that we had to uh, adapt to, uh, things that we hadn't anticipated. And the first one was uh, giving prices. Uh, we have a retail product and uh, many of the distributors that we talk to and indeed many of the retailers that we talk to uh, would ask for prices which we would give only to find latterly that there would be complexities of the market and Retailers would be looking for retro rebates, uh, contributions to marketing, and all of a sudden the price that we had given was hopelessly optimistic uh, or, or, or too low. And in the end, uh, we found that we, we simply had to give prices once only we understand, understood exactly uh, the market and the customer we were uh, supplying. Exclusive distribution agreements are something that we, we, again, we used to get involved with quite a lot um, and, and we've changed somewhat. What we found was exclusive distribution can be taken for a number of different reasons. Um, firstly, it's because the distributor wants protection in their market and they want to really succeed and they're the good distributors to have. But by the same token, you may get a distributor who takes your exclusive distribution rights and then does nothing with them for no other reason than they decide they've changed their mind. And then there's a third type of distributor who takes your products simply because they don't want them in the marketplace and they would much rather place a small order with you, relatively speaking, 
have the product set in the warehouse uh, and then keep and then successfully keep your brand and your products out of their market uh, until such time that the uh, the supplier buzz um, identifies that there's something going horribly wrong whenever we do set a distribution agreement whether it be exclusive or otherwise we look to mutually set a target and on that basis we are always able to then negotiate a way out of a term if uh, we aren't getting the business that we expected one of the key things um, is to make sure that you structure your business uh, so that it succeeds and it delivers on the promises uh, that it makes uh, internationally it's always uh, a, the biggest sin to make sure that um, you, your your business uh, fails if your business fails a big fine if your business fails all of a sudden you've lost all the reputation that you have and uh, that would never never work uh, long term for an international relationship um, you also need to invest in your distributors if you're enjoying success in the UK you're looking to maximize your your market base you 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 do everything that you possibly can to get success well you're going to expect exactly the same from your international distributors and they will not know your product anywhere near as well as you do so you need to help them to get to the level of competency that you have within your uh, organization here in the UK uh, new slide so you've gone out there you've got the business and it's all coming in and you're growing exponentially and that's one of the great things about export it can have a dramatic effect very quickly on your business but that comes at a risk and you need to prepare for those risks cash flow is king in any business we all know that um, but there are, are options um, international factoring works exactly the same way as factoring in the uh, in the UK and that's something that we've used very successfully but also uh, our, our, our preferred method is payment on release of goods don't offer the credit if your products are good enough and they're in demand sufficiently then distributors are normally prepared to pay for it certainly you pay for it when you deal with China 30% um, up front so that you're not making any products at a risk and then uh, payment on release and that works really well uh, inventory control if you're used to supplying in the UK um, it may be just a, a very simple way of supplying on a weekly basis uh, your customers are steady you know that, that they know that what they want to buy and then that all of a sudden um, the, the, the stock control takes care of itself export however is different you may today get an international distributor in Germany tomorrow one in France another day in Spain and then one time in America and before you know it you're not dealing in small product volume you're dealing in bulk that is perhaps designed to last two or three months and that can have a massive impact on uh, the products you need to store and the products you need to buy um, we talked about it before reliability and supply if you miss a day on dispatch for an export order you may be delaying your customers receipt of the goods by anything up to two to three weeks depending on how they were planning on shipping it so it's crucially important that you are able to supply as and when you say you do and that you structure your business to do that and then finally corporate restructuring too much business that export can deliver can be more toxic than no business at all so you need to ensure that you identify the limitations of your company and that you trade within them always plan for the growth always ensure that you are able to accept as much business as you possibly can but be very careful not to take on too much because all of a sudden you may find yourselves being unreliable again uh, last slide hi Stephen we've actually had a really good question next, come in next slide there Jim uh, just before uh, I move on to the next slide we've had a really great okay, question come much. in um, so we have yeah. a, a user asking can you clarify what international invoice factoring is and how they can use that to better their exports okay invoice factoring is very similar to the factoring in the UK uh, generally uh, a good place to start talking to somebody about that is your bank and when you raise an invoice you can present that to your bank who will uh, have already pre-arranged and agreed with you that you can factor the invoice with your uh, with the bank against that customer so for example 
let's say I've got um, one of the biggest retailers in the United States and he wants to buy a hundred thousand pounds worth of uh, stock what the bank will say is yeah we know this retailer they're a really strong company they are good for the money they're never going to pay up front they only have a deal on credit terms we understand how that business works and what we will do is we will take that invoice that you raise and we will lend you maybe 80% so they will give us 80,000 pounds as, a, as an advance on the payment of the the, uh, the invoice and then when the American retailer pays the bank the bank will then pay us the rest of the money uh, which will be twenty thousand pounds less a commission and an interest charge on the money that we borrowed uh, prior to to the invoice being paid so it's a really good way and that, that that's that's a very common um, way of financing export uh, international partners know it it's it, it's it's an internationally recognized and acceptable way of financing an export deal fantastic fantastic help? yeah yeah that's great Stephen thank you very much so let's move on to uh, on to your next slide there you go yeah this is where uh, we just really wrap up I mean exporting we had never exported up to four years ago and the rewards that we found commercially have been really good over 25 percent of our business is now generated through export and that's growing year on year but on top of the the commercial benefits personally exporting is so exciting it takes people around the world my staff and myself have found ourselves in situations that we would never have thought possible uh, four years ago uh, it's helped us culturally it's helped us as a business uh, we've learned so much more we've been able to diversify our the way we trade the way we manufacture products the way we look at things and it has been a massive benefit not just commercially to the business as a whole and get out there and enjoy it and that's it hopefully that's been of some help for you guys Fantastic. Thank you so much, Stephen, for that. It was really useful content. Um, it's generated quite a lot of questions, as you would imagine. <laughs> um, okay. So I'm just going to put a couple to you now, um, just to the, the attendees on the line. Apologies if we don't get to your question right now. Please do keep them coming in via the question box. and We will try and get as many of them answered as we can at the end of the session. Um, so just a couple now, Stephen. So, which market did you start with, and why did you choose that market? Uh, well, <laughs> that's that's a very good question. Our we launched our products in the January of 2010, and our first international trade show was in March 2010, which was held in Germany. So, I guess the answer to the question is we plan to launch and and get most of our attention in Europe. Um, however, it didn't quite turn out that way. Um, it turned out that the trade show had visitors from all around the world and where we expected to perhaps have inquiries from two or three people, genuinely, we, we didn't know how successful it would be. Um, we walked away from that four day show with inquiries from over 50 countries. Oh, wow. and that really took us by surprise it, it was it was the utopian moment we we really didn't expect to have the success that we did um, so what we did then was we ensured that we whittled it down um, we knew that we were never going to start selling to 50 countries and we still don't um, you have to be selective and we took the the, the easiest fruit uh, from the tree uh, so uh, we took mainly Europe um, uh, and, and and well yeah Europe uh, in particular so we looked at the Benelux regions Germany Spain France areas like that uh, Spain uh, but we 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 also from that very first show um, started working with Croatia and Slovakia uh, which we didn't expect um, and they proved to be really good distributors um, they weren't in the, the top 10 of the European companies countries that we thought we would work with um, and then further afield we, we picked up a Chinese distributor <laughs> at that show uh, and, and as a UK manufacturing company who has bought for many years from China to f suddenly find ourselves exporting to China 
was um, well, it was, it was just a fine moment, a fine moment. Wow. Okay. Thank you so much for that. Um, so Alf, I think I'll leave it there. I know that I have other questions to get to, but just in the interest of time, I think we'll try cover okay. cover those off at the end. Stephen, thank you so much for that. And please do hang on the line um, and we'll, we'll come back to we'll you for more questions a little later on. Okay. Um, so I would like to bring into the call um, Bill Brown, who is the Managing Director of Angloco. Um, Bill, are you on the line with us? Are you there? Can you join? Yes, I'm with you. Fantastic. I mean, a fascinating presentation. Yeah. Lots, lots of interesting things that we don't get involved in exports with that Stephen's covered, but some very much good points of commonality which I might refer to as we go along. Oh, fantastic, fantastic. And I understand that you have your son Alistair with you there as well, is that correct? Yes, I'm, I'm here to uh, support if there's any uh, questions Bill isn't uh, comfortable handling, I'll, I'll, I'll support him on those. Fantastic. Okay, guys. So whenever you're ready, let's uh, let's get started. Well, uh, my my presentation is is mainly is relying is going to be on 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 questions from the audience really, uh, but just to go very quickly through it, uh, you have a, a small selection of slides, and if we can just have a look at the pictures as we go along, the first one, Gemma, that we should have is a photograph of two vehicles, one clearly an old one and one more current, and the old one is the significant one that we first built in 1974. That was our first fire engine. Uh, moving on to the, uh, the first slide itself, I think that summarizes what we do. Um, we uh, design and manufacture our own vehicles. We don't design chassis. We buy those in from well-known companies ranging from the smallest end of the scale, something like Land Rovers, up to the top end of the scale, which would be uh, include chassis from major manufacturers like Scania, Mercedes, MAN, Volvo, and so on. Uh, we built our first fire engine, as I've already said, in uh, 1974 for the UK market. Uh, and since then, we've developed the range of products and certainly the range of countries to which we sell. Um, it's a very competitive market. Uh, both in the UK and overseas. Just concentrating a little bit for the moment on mentioning the UK, since we built our first fire engine in 1974, we have seen 27, 27 companies or builders of fire engines in the UK go out of business. And the most recent one was in November last year, so it's, it's ongoing. And to some extent, it is that pressure, and most listeners, I think, will be aware of the pressures that have been exerted on the public sector by governments to get costs down, and that of course includes fire services. So one way or the other, the fire service in the UK is, is getting smaller. Um, so over a long period, we've been aware of the fall in markets. I can't give you an exact figure, but somewhere like 74, there'd be a, approximately 800 vehicles a year, fire engines, exported from the UK. One manufacturer alone, in addition to his own business, exported over 400. <clears throat> That's now diminished, and we are probably the smallest, with the largest company building fire engines in the UK. We're probably um, the quantities that we export compared to European countries is very small. And just might, if I can just dwell on that to explain what is the significance of that comment. If we take a country like Germany, their domestic market, their population is a bit larger than ours, I think. What is it, 90 million now? The UK is just over 60 million. So they are a bit bigger, but they buy a minimum of straightforward domestic fire engines. Every year they, they supply over 2,000. Now in the UK, the annual demand from the local authorities is down to 200. So the pressure is on, obviously, on things like exports, or selected products which we make in our range. Uh, we have grown. Last year was our record year, the 21st year in succession when we've increased our turnover and pre-tax profit. And for a small family company employing just over 70 people, being in the engineering field, that's not too bad. Exports do play a vital role. You flick over to the next, uh, next slide, which shows the images of some of the vehicles, it gives you an indication of the sort of markets we cover. Uh, the image in top left, 
You can probably gather from the lettering on the side and the mosque in the background, that's Bahrain, very good customer. Uh, the one to the top right, obviously. Uh, China, well, not China related, that particular one is one of many we have serving in Hong Kong. Uh, bottom right, that's a major refinery tender for BP in Trinidad. We've just received an order for a second one of those. Um, and, and to give you an idea just of sort of prices, that one would have a sales price of over £500,000. And then in the bottom left corner, we get involved in all sorts of experiments. Um, this was a very much a go faster fire engine, a converted BMW for a local fire service in the UK. So this is the range of products um, we, we have to offer. Um, and we've mentioned in over 50 countries. How did we start? Well, one of the things we have, a, I think, a, a very great advantage in the UK. Um, what if you could go to the next, next slide, please? Thank you. Um, one of the things that's not mentioned on the slide, but it's, it's, it's how we started and we still, it still helps us in, in, in a good way. Um, the asset we've got, I suppose, is that the UK operates the most professional fire service in the world. And that, that's a fact, having visited lots of them overseas. Uh, it's a superb fire service. It's highly respected. Uh, lots of initiatives come from the UK. They're now working on smaller and smaller budgets, but it's a highly professional operation. And when we first started thinking of exporting, people had contacts overseas, and many fire officers, uh, younger fire officers, migrated from the UK to other parts of the Commonwealth. And in fact, it's, if we go back in time, it is that part of the world that in those days was painted pinks, pink on world maps to show they were part of the Commonwealth, where we began to uh, aim at, for the simple reason that they wanted designs that in several ways were like the UK vehicles, uh, except they are different operational requirements. One of the basic differences normally with exports is that whereas in the UK, our standard fire engines carry a very small amount of, of water, probably 1,800 litres topside in the municipal brigades, uh, I'm probably down in some fire services to a thousand litres for the simple reason that we're fortunate in lots and lots of main supply of water with easily accessible hydrants. You go to some other countries and they just don't have that. So they want very large water tanks and foam tanks and that's been the basis of a lot of the vehicles we've built. Our first experience was to go uh, to, we've got a contact in the fire service he wasn't the head of the Hong Kong Fire Service, but of the Hong Kong Island part. And uh, I met him in the UK and said, you must come out to see us. And to cut a long story short, uh, I first went out in 82. And within a few months, we'd got our first order. One of the things you laugh about at the time, it doesn't happen today, but we, they placed an order with us for seven small new vehicles. And within about three or four weeks, we'd ordered the chassis and started ordering the materials. We got a call from the company who represented us. And how we pulled this one off, I don't know. But uh, the company was Jardine Matheson, just about the largest company you can get in Hong Kong. There were a lot of expats there. And they'd heard about our start into export activities and they wanted to represent us in Hong Kong. And we received this order for seven. And three or four weeks later, we got this very sort of uh, gentle phone call saying, um, you know that order for seven, um, is there any chance we might be able to increase it to 14? And that was our very first order overseas. They didn't ask for a discount. They were quite happy to work with the same price. And that was the business in 82. It's a marked contrast to where we are today. Um, we have to now adapt the products to meet not only the demands of the market, but the demands of the chief officers. An important sector to us is the petrochemical and oil industry, where the risks they are at, at different uh, refineries uh, varies considerably. And there's an old adage, every chief officer thinks he knows how to design the best fire engine. And being a small company, we therefore have to be prepared to design vehicles to meet those specific requirements. And 
normally they buy in one off at a time. Their prices for refinery vehicles could go anywhere from, you know, I don't know, 250,000 to 750,000. And it's tailor making those. Sometimes you will have perhaps ex fire officers from the USA. And when you meet with those overseas, they will be specifying componentry and bumps and operating systems that they are familiar with in the state. So then we have to meet those requirements. And sometimes they baffle us a little bit. Um, we'll, we'll, we won't go too much in that direction, but we do have a little bit of fun sometimes with the, uh, with the Americans, their peculiar requirements. Uh, they operate in a big country, as we all know. They've got big cities, big wide roads, and they don't have to turn on the sixpence, which they tend to have to do in, in Britain and most parts of Europe. So it's this versatility and the preparedness that we've got, I suppose, uh, our in-house design systems uh, that enabled us to continue to win, uh, to win business overseas. Uh, ne next slide, uh, Jammer, please. Uh, in, in going into exporting, uh, we're obviously in, I suppose, what's called the capital goods market, entirely different to what uh, Stuart was describing. Uh, and we think, and it has been a contributory factor to our growth, is market visits are very important, particularly when you're going to new markets and get the feel of it. I mean, those of you who are listening in are familiar with the Middle East. You know, you look at markets that we're in, and they're quite different. I mean, Qatar is quite different to Bahrain, which is next door. And Bahrain is different to Abu Dhabi and Oman. And they all have their slight different requirements, which, which you've got to pander to. We do exhibit, wherever possible, overseas. Um, history has taught us that you don't go if you can't show the hardware. Uh, I.e. to show fire engines uh, and we went to one of the big exhibitions in Dubai, big stand, British pavilion, loads of photographs but no finished vehicles just happening to be there at the time and of course it would be very expensive to ship vehicles out and then back again and going through the problem of exporting it as well as importing it. Um, but we do go to exhibitions and one of our favourite ones is in Qatar. Every second year they have a civil defence exhibition. And just coincidentally, we just happened to be finishing a vehicle to show at the exhibition. And we were there again last November, and it was very popular. Lots of new leads came up. Uh, there's a, a phrase there, working and appointing local partners. And of course, your partners come in all shapes and sizes. We can go to distributors who would buy and sell in their own right. We could go through agents who would just get some commission at the end of the day on completion of the contract. Um, sometimes we just get one-off inquiries out of the blue from countries we've never visited. I'm thinking of Afghanistan, Laos, Principe, and somebody saying Principe. Uh, if you look at a map, west coast of Africa, offshore islands, somewhere off the coast of Nigeria. That's as little, and we've never been to Principe, but we supplied one Land Rover. And similarly to Laos, we haven't actually visited Laos, and of course, with the problems, ongoing problems in Afghanistan, we've never visited there. We've supplied five vehicles for the armed forces out there, uh, but we've actually supplied two or three vehicles on the civilian side. Um, and sometimes we deal direct with governments. So the Caribbean is an important market to us, and there the choice is on most of the islands you can go through, with the exception of. Trinidad and Jamaica, the islands would not have any customers other than the government. The government will run the civil defense, uh, they'll operate the airport where we also supply vehicles, but there are no industries big enough to warrant buying their own fire engines, except as I say in Trinidad and, and Jamaica. Uh, the interesting thing that uh, Stuart mentioned was his comment where he was talking about some people want, want the distributorship just to keep you out of the market. Uh, others, because really they get the distributorship and then they don't really want to do with it. And occasionally you get a duel and they're really keen and they're enthusiastic. Um, so we do have problems with, with those. Um, what we tend to do, uh, and, and here's a plug, and I'm not being paid for this by the way, but we work with an organization called BT UK DI, 
and through there they offer a service called OMIS, Overseas Market uh, Introductory Services. And if you don't know about a market, it's worth paying not a lot of money to get their reports from their embassies or high commissions on the territory who will give you an overview of the market. What we do now is we prepare a, a, a detailed brief as to the partnership organization we'd like to work with, and then they will draw up a, a, a partner's list, and from that partner's list, we will select three or four companies uh, to visit uh, to represent us. Uh, and in some situations, they will help considerably. The first really big order we had in Barbados, in the Caribbean, um, another plug here, uh, every single fire engine in Barbados has an Angloco badge on the front. They're very, very strong supporters of the company, and we've been dealing with them since the uh, early 90s. And the High Commission there, first rate, we got a very big order in 2000 uh, to deliver the vehicles in 2001, uh, and the High Commission said, uh, are you going to show these to the rest of the Caribbean? And we said, well, yes. And they just made the little comment, no one will come unless you pay their airfares. This is not a bribe. They just don't have the money. But we would recommend you to fund airfares, people coming in and out to have a look at your vehicles. And there were 15 vehicles there to look at. And boy, did that pay for itself. They arranged. We paid the, for the services of the High Commission to select the flights. Some of the islands, didn't. you weren't able to get there and back to Barbados in a day. So I had to stay overnight, so we had to fund that. Uh, and it really paid dividends. And there are certain orders that we got subsequently in the next couple of years entirely due to participating at that exhibition and inviting the people that mattered. We normally asked for the chief fire officer and his chief engineer, and that went down very well. Um, we obviously have demonstrations wherever possible. Uh, and we like keeping our local partners uh, on, on their toes. Um, certainly, the, in, in more recent years, we have been using UKTI to look for new partners because partners don't last forever. Just coming back to the point that uh, Stuart was mentioning, uh, slightly different for us, we st unnamed territory this, but we started off with a very small partner. And at the end of the first year, we had delivered one vehicle, our first vehicle into that market. He was involved in other fire products. And the MD said to me, do you know what you've done for us this year, Bill? You've helped us to double our turnover. So one vehicle doubled his turnover for everything else he was mentioning it. Over the passage of time, uh, 12, probably 15 years, that company has completely outgrown Angloco. And whereas Angloco was initially an extremely valued partner, as it got on, we become, well, we're something a fringe activity because what they're now doing, you know, we probably account for five or at the most 10% of their business in a good year. So these things happen, and I think you've got to be on your toes to watch what your distributors do. Another market in the Caribbean, we work through a distributor, beautiful guy, lovely guy, best engineer we've ever met in one of our distributors. But you go and you get on your plane, and he forgets all about you. And in this particular market, working for him 15 years, he sold us four vehicles in the marketplace, which you know you can't you can't really live in that market on four vehicles. Uh, ne next slide, please. Hi, Bill. Thanks for all that. That's such great key, content. Key. Um, just in the in the interest of time, because I'm just conscious that we've received so many great questions for for both you and Stephen. Um, if we could kind of um, just move the next couple along as quickly as possible, and then we can get to the questions. Yeah. Okay. Right. Uh, well, it, it, this is the very very important one. It's an integral part of our business, and, and probably you don't get in in moving fast moving consumer goods, but in our business, after sales services of paramount importance. And if you support your sales with that service. We'll send our engineers, we'll come, we'll do the training and commissioning so you get it right. We'll offer you long-term contracts, we'll offer you parts from our stock. That's what they want to hear. And surprisingly, some of the biggest competitors we've got in Europe and the States, they only pay lip service to after-sale service. This is of paramount importance to us. Put all that package together and we're continuing to grow uh, and add new, new overseas markets to our list.
Uh, Bill, that's fantastic. Thank you so much. I'm just going to introduce my colleague, Matthew. Yes, hi, everyone. Um, so just one question for you, Bill, um, picking up on your presentation. Um, I had a question in from Ian, um, who was just commenting. Um, you talked a lot about um, all the different product requirements um, that you had from different suppliers. Um, could you say a bit more about how you deal with those cost effectively? And have there been um, situations where you have to turn down business because actually it wasn't cost effective to support those orders? Normally, we would we would would try to talk to the customer. If his specification was a bit off beam, as far as we were concerned, we would probe a little more deeply to find out what he really wanted. Uh, and sometimes. Um, you know, they use old specifications which are no longer relevant in the market. Uh, and we have to advise them, well, you can't get that pump anymore, but now you can get a fire pump, you know, the integral, the soul of the vehicle, if you like, uh, will perform in this way and it can give you better pressure and you can have more outputs, etc. And sometimes we talk to them. But in answer to the question, we do have to reject a lot of the inquiries we get from certain parts of the world. Um, we know we are going to be up against the local builders who will be a lot less expensive than we would be. Uh, and, you know, when you have the experience of having put in quote after you tell, well, you're three times more expensive uh, than the local builders, um, we have to be, as I say, selective and know the market. You can spend an awful long time on doing tenders and then they, they you know, they're just not considered or you're way out. So you have to do a little bit of homework to make sure that your tendering process is worthwhile. Thanks, Bill. That's that's a great answer. And um, opening up the the floor to kind of um, both yourselves and um, Stephen, there's a couple of um, more general questions. Um, this one from Paul, um, really about um, I think um, how to get the best out of your distributors and agents. Um, so I know both of you mentioned um, sort of you need to kind of work them hard. Do you have any kind of um, tips to share about um, techniques that you found um, um, help with the performance of your representatives? And Paul mentions things like um, sales and promotion offers. So, um, any, any, any top tips for, for, for getting the most out of your, your, your regional representatives? Just stay in touch. Visit them as often as, as possible. Um, quite often, of course, in the process of building the vehicle, we would have, I mean, this wouldn't happen with a small Land Rover, but the bigger vehicles, you will have visits which the representative, he will accompany the end user, and they will come over for pre-build meetings to make sure we're all in the same wavelength, mid-build meetings, and final acceptance meetings. And that helps with team building and they can, your distributor will keep up to date and see what else you're doing on the shop floor and it will also open the eyes of the end user. Uh, so that's important. We obviously speak regularly on the phone. If something is pot boiling, you know, we might be on the phone to them two or three times a week. Okay, so uh, keeping contacts. And Stephen, anything, um, anything from your side, any, anything from your experience? Yeah, I think uh, it's, it's, whether it's a, a big uh, item like a fire engine or a, a fast-moving consumer good, the, the rules really are the same. Uh, communication is key uh, and building the relationship. Uh, if you fail to build the relationship, then there's no motivation for cooperation and, and to do well. Um, so we work very hard. Uh, we treat all our distributors as though they were an employee. Uh, and we wouldn't send out an employee without the right training um, and without the right motivation. And so we try and engage in exactly the same way. We try and meet our distributors as often as we can. I think uh, something that Bill mentioned was trade shows. Uh, for the industries that we work in, there are only a few. There are probably about between five and ten worthwhile trade shows around the world. And we don't necessarily do trade shows to meet new customers, although that's always nice. We, we also do trade shows to use it as a great opportunity to meet very many of our distributors all under the same one roof. And that can save us an absolute fortune in airfare and time. 
Okay, there's some great tips there. So um, I'm conscious we've reached the end of our advertised time. If the speakers are happy to stay on for a few minutes, and um, we have got some more great questions. Um, but if um, anyone out there um, in the audience does need to duck off, um, if we could just ask you to fill in the feedback survey um, when you do shut down. And uh, the, the webinar, um, as Gemma mentioned, will be available um, on YouTube um, if you want to um, revisit anything that's been covered. Um, are you guys okay to stay on for a few minutes just to take the additional questions? Yeah, sure. Yep, yeah, okay. sure. Um, another question that's come up, this one um, from Abir. His question was specifically about Saudi Arabia, but I think there's a more general question here. Um, around how um, you have dealt with um, different sort of cultural um, considerations when you're going into a new market, particularly um, markets that um, do business very differently. Um, Middle East has, has come up as one, um, and, and Stephen, you, you've got a sort of um, a, a, a large number of territories you're in. Uh, maybe mm -hmm. we start with Stephen this time. Um, any, any observations or, or guidance in terms of how to deal with those cultural differences? Um, we've not been exposed to a great deal of cultural difference. Uh, one of, we have a really good distributor in Saudi Arabia. Um, however, one of the principally our our main focus as a business is uh, pet control product, pet products for dogs. Um, and our distributor in Saudi Arabia is great. They sell a lot of products. Really highly motivated guys, uh, but. Principally, the most common pet over there are cats. So we are we are now in the process of launching a whole range of cat products, um, which we will sell globally. But the main driver for that has come from um, from Saudi Arabia. So in 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 one respect, the the, the cultural difference <laughs> unusually is just simply the the different um, uh, pet that is kept. Uh, in terms of business. Uh, we haven't really had any problems um, in 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 any way, shape, or form. But one of the problems that we did have was getting the label correct. Um, uh, Arabic is not uh, something that we are used to, and the translations would come over. We would send them to our English label manufacturer. We would then send them over for proofing, and they would be wrong. And then it would come back, and it went backwards and forwards, and we probably took five different drafts until we got the labeling correct, um, which I have to say is embarrassing. Um, uh, but after review, we weren't entirely sure how we could have avoided that. Um, our distributor wasn't so precious as to um, expect us to employ a, a, a translator just to get it right. They were happy to work with us to get it right. So um, that's probably the biggest obstacle that we found. Okay, great practical insights. Bill, Alistair, any, any market you've been in that's um, presented particular challenges from a culture point of view, and how did you deal with them in a, in a, in a, in a few sentences? Yeah, it, 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 Alistair here for a change is Anglo. Okay. Um, on the Middle Eastern one, um, I guess we have come across some, uh, not cultural barriers, but over the years you, you, you learn to deal with it. One, one of the bits of advice I'd give to any prospective exporters to that part of the world is allow plenty of time for your business trips. It, initially, from our culture, it could be taken as, as rudeness, but over time we've realized it's, it's not. It's part of the culture. People miss appointments quite regularly. They fail to turn up to them. You might find yourself waiting in the reception of a, a company all morning uh, to have a meeting with someone and it turns out they went out and no one bothered to tell you. So d do allow plenty of time for your trip. Don't, don't expect that it will run to clockwork as it might do in the UK or, or Western Europe. Um, and and that, that probably applies to a lot of things. It, it, it projects can take a lot longer to complete because, because of that cultural difference. That, that would be something I think particularly with the Middle East, to some extent we've experienced that in the Caribbean, and it, it's really what you learn is that it's not rudeness on behalf of, of the person, it, it is just a cultural difference, um, and, and, not, and don't become frustrated with it. Okay, no, that sounds like really, really sound um, advice. Okay, well just to, um, to wrap it up with a... Oh, sorry, go on. 
I was just going to say, in parallel with that, you have the problem about how quickly do they, do they react to the tenders that you have submitted. And there's a lot of time goes into tenders. And sometimes we've even had a tender that is two years old. And they'll come back and say, you know that tender, is it still valid? Can you hold the price? Because we might want to place a contract two years after the event. And you, need, what you, need, you need some patience. This is not a, not a, not a, not a, not a short game. OK, great. Thank That's you, right. Jonathan. That's yep. great. Okay. Um, yep. So just to kind of and wrap up on the questions, I think kind of reflecting on your respective stories, which are both kind of very fascinating, um, thinking back to your kind of early days and what you might have done on differently or challenges you've encountered along the way, um, what would you say, if you had to give top three tips to um, those who are kind of newer to, um, to international trade, just getting started, maybe um, looking at their first couple of markets, um, what would each of your um, top three tips be um, to those companies? Um, Stephen? Whew, okay. Um, well, a couple of them, one of them has probably already uh, been mentioned a number of times, and it really it, it is the big one, and that is um, work with your distributors or partners um, and treat them exactly as partners. You've got to, however much time and effort you think you're going to need to invest in them, you will need to invest more. Um, it, it's it's the biggest key to success in a in a in a foreign market. Uh, I think the other one, another one would be um, languages. Uh, typically, uh, the British are not renowned for their uh, linguistic skills, um, and very commonly, people, even if you attempt to speak a language to somebody, they will oh, don't bother. We'll, we'll speak, we'll speak in English for you. Um, but uh, if, if you call a meeting, uh, ensure that you uh, have the capacity to actually communicate in the language uh, of the the uh, country that you have called the meeting in. Um, if you are inviting somebody in, uh, at least expect that meeting to be held in the language of the the, the language that you are you are entertaining. Um, that's, th that's quite key. And then the, the last one is be prepared to adapt. Um, however much preparation and however much planning you've put in, if something isn't working, change it. Um, there's too much uh, belligerence. Uh, to uh, within structures to maintain on something that is believed to be correct. Um, if you learn that it isn't working for a particular market, a really good example is perhaps if you set a minimum order. Um, we know companies who have a minimum order for whatever market it is, which is absolutely crackers because if you've got the USA wanting to buy from you and then you've got Malta, you'll never get the Maltese distributor to buy a minimum order that you set for the USA. So you have to adapt, you have to change, uh, and, and be prepared to compromise uh, in order to get business. Uh, Bill made a really good example there of one customer who uh, started out as being a small customer who sold one unit, and now they are significantly bigger than the, the company uh, they once were. And uh, you should always be prepared for uh, businesses to, to develop and grow and try and plan to grow with them. Okay, great. Probably some very hard-won insights there, so thank you for sharing those. Um, Bill, Anastasia, so to close your three tips. I think really one or two of the comments I've already made. I think visiting the markets, getting the feel of the people you're dealing with, what are their customs, what are they expecting, visit, press the flesh is the old phrase, and that will pay dividends. And uh, secondly, make sure that you've got a good brief as to what you expect of your partner, whatever that form it might be, whether it's a distributor or whether it's an agent or whatever, make it very clear what you're looking for. And with our OMIS reports that are done for us, we write a good brief that the High Commission or the Embassy will convey to people who want to be prospective partners. And so that you see it in writing, you've set it out, that's what we're looking for. It's not the agreement itself, but these are the sort of qualities we would expect. Uh, and I think the big one, which I don't think I've mentioned, but I'm sure it's near and dear to Stephen's heart, and he did mention that, is make sure you get the ducks in a row when it comes to payment. Yes. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, and I think that sounds like a very, a very fitting, fitting note on which to close, guys. Okay, so thank you so much. I'm going to hand you back to Jim just to wrap up. Um, and, and thank you so much for your, for your, 
your uh, your contributions. Thank you. Hi, thank you so much, guys, and thank you for um, all the attendees that have um, have hung around to the end here. To uh, I'm sure you'll agree that we we've covered off some really great content. And thank you, Stephen and Phil and Alistair, for your time today. Um, just in closing, this was the final instalment of our export bootcamp webinar, which has been aimed at um, getting um, SMEs export plans in shape for 2014. You can catch up on any of the installments you've missed and watch any of our features back on our YouTube channel. We, we do tend to get them up there within kind of one to two days of the event taking place. So it's a wealth of content for people looking to learn more about international trade. Um, just moving on to kind of what we're going to be uh, covering in the coming months. We have a really exciting e-commerce feature plan. So if you've ever wanted to know how to transform you, your website into an international sales tool um, and automatically reach new businesses and consumers in international markets, or perhaps you want to trade via marketplaces such as Amazon or eBay, we're going to be uh, a running feature in the next couple of months on that. So do, uh, do register on the site to keep informed. Uh, registering only takes about 30 seconds if you haven't done already. Um, that's great. And also as well, if you could, at the end of the call complete the uh, the short survey would be grateful for your feedback so we can improve our service so thank you very much for for uh, staying on the call and we'll see you on the next webinar thank you yep and Gemma thanks very much for your own input <laughs> thanks guys